Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. The Stanley Handyman versus the Amazon Basics. I'm going to review and compare, share with you my results, see what we find. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell, which will alert you whenever we release a new video. Anytime we use a new tool or technique, we'll leave a description down below so that make it easier for you to find. All right, let's get back to work. Uh, a while ago, I did a review on this uh, Amazon Basics plane. Jake picked it up for $49, and a uh, bit of a spoiler alert, it didn't do so well. But a lot of folks are looking for an inexpensive plane, not so sure how deep they want to get into this, but they'd like to try it out. So the question is, could a Stanley Handyman be a better choice? Now, Luther bought this on eBay for 27, so just about half the price of the new Amazon Basics. So what I want to do is tear them apart and do the same thing I did to that one, to the Stanley Handyman, and let's see how it compares. It's uh, probably 50 years old. Um, that doesn't really matter if the plane is well made. But the final question is, could I feel good in recommending this to someone who's looking for an inexpensive plane to at least get started? Now, you can go through, we'll leave a link below, and you can watch the video that we did where we tore this apart and told you exactly what I thought. This time, it's going to be the Stanley Handyman's turn. And I'm going to compare and contrast as we go so you can get a really good feel for whether or not the money is worth being spent on this or that or scrap them both and get something even better. Early on, Stanley recognized that there were many potential customers that didn't make their, necessarily make their livelihoods in the crafts industry, but they did want some form of a plane that they could use. They weren't willing to spend the money on something like the Bedrock or the Bailey plane. But what they needed was a less expensive tool that was designed for the occasional use only. And Stanley's assumption proved to be correct because over the years they came out with a number of consumer grade lines of planes. There was the Liberty Bell, Foursquare, Victor, Defiance, Two-Tone, and of course the Handyman. The Handyman plane line was Rep, uh, uh, replaced the Defiance line and was produced from about 1957 right through to 1973. And the handyman planes had an H preceding the number on them. The series consisted of nine block and bench planes. Early models, I think, were painted gray with perhaps a red trim, and later castings were painted with uh, dark blue with black painted hardwood knob and tote, and tote is the rear handle. Basically, the handyman is a Bailey design with some shortcuts to make it less expensive. And I'm not aware of what the shortcuts are, but in the process of tearing this apart, let's see if we can find out. Now, I'm going to identify whatever I can find on here. It says, made in the USA. It's got Stanley on the lever cap. Um, it's got some numbers underneath here, but don't really tell me anything. Awfully, wouldn't be a serial number because they're actually cast, or they're uh, cast right into the casting itself. However, based on the size, I would call that a number three. The blade should be an inch and three quarter. It is, and the Amazon Basics was uh, has a number right on it, number four. So the difference between a four and a three was the width of the blade: two inch over here, inch and three quarter over here. Length of the sole is not much different. This just shy of ten inches, and this one is nine and a half. So from a performance function, really not much to even bother with, or, or not, not a big enough difference to say that the four is gonna do something that the three couldn't do. I'm really big on ergonomics. If the tool doesn't fit in your hand and feel right, you're not gonna reach for it, no matter how much money you spent or how much money you didn't spend on it. So I'm picking this up, and I'm just gonna give you my first impressions. Now, I've only handled this plane for the last 15 minutes. Um, the rear tote is real boxy. It doesn't have much in terms of a profile, so it's got some hard edges. So when you hold onto that, that's not what I would call comfortable. And if you were to compare it with this, not a whole lot different. Big flat spot here, not a tremendous amount of radius on there. Really, that feels really clunky in the hand, 
And remember, I'll hold it properly, it's a, designed for a three finger grip. And boy, not a lot of difference. And something you'll also notice that there's a toe screw on the uh, Amazon Basic. So your plane come, your handle comes down here and then goes out under there, which it, that's, in, compared to most planes, this is really thick and it really crams your pinky. Now, number three and number fours typically did not have a toe screw. And this one has very little uh, forward material out here. So that opens up quite a bit of room for your pinky. So if I were to rethink this, this is really crammed. This is less crammed. So in addition to being slightly tilted forward, I, I think this is actually a little more comfortable. Not fancy, but a little more comfortable. First look at the chip breaker. Ah, pardon me, the lever cap. So the lever cap is made out of metal, uh, probably cast, whereas, and it's a typical lever cap, unlike what they have on the Amazon Basics. If you remember, this is some pot metal or something, feels really chintzy, hardly weighs anything at all. So this, this is, um, this is okay. Now the first thing you're gonna notice it on most good planes, the lever cap is going to have a piece of metal right here so that when you're uh, applying the pressure of the lever cap, it doesn't move uh, where it contacts the back side of the chip breaker. So obviously, if we're looking for places where they save money, that would have been a little bit of work. You can, you can, in fact, my first impression is that they use the same lever cap, they just eliminated this step to save a little bit of labor. Not much of materials, but a bit of labor. So there's one spot we just found. Other than that, it's okay. We'll check it and see how flat it is on the underside. Take the chip breaker and the blade out. Now this is the old style, which has got the curve on the chip breaker. Compare it to what we have over here. Whenever I see something shiny like this, it just, for some reason, it rubs me wrong. It looks rather chintzy. So if we were to compare the two, this one, the Stanley, looks to be better made. Now, I would give the advantage to the Stanley. Now if we compare the blades, ignoring the fact that one's a little bit wider, and obviously this one has been used, so it's had some wear. They're about the same thickness. In fact, probably they are the same thickness. We'll find out how well it holds an edge when we take the time to sharpen it, but. Kind of hard to give advantage to one or the other. I, I still, I, I don't like the look of this. It just, it has that, uh, what do they want to say? A, a turd, a polished turd is still a turd. That's my comment about the Amazon Basics blade. So, so far, advantage goes to the Stanley. Now the place where you typically see the most machining, and this I think is the best way to determine whether or not you've got a, a, a decent plane or a piece of junk, is the frog. And it's, uh, neither one of them are looking great. We, we, we talked about this, how terrible the machining is. You've got mill marks all over the place. You've got paint. You've got bare spots. This is just really bad. But if you look over here, it's not a whole lot better. I'm going to take these screws out and have a closer look at it. So ideally, you want your blade to be sitting on a uh, flat, cleanly milled surface to prevent any vibration, or at least to eliminate it as best as possible. But if you look at this, this is rough cast, so this is just painted rough cast. 
There's been no milling done to it, which means it's almost impossible to think that this is actually flat. And if we were to take all these pieces off and lay it on a flat surface and rub it around for a few seconds on an abrasive, or some form of abrasive, you'd see spots where it would touch, but almost guarantee you would not have one flat surface. So if we take the screw out, they're all relatively sloppy. I don't know why they couldn't do a better job on that. This one, the Amazon probably is even worse. Uh, lateral adjustment lever. My complaint over here was the lateral adjustment lever is just a piece of bent steel. Uh, nothing, nothing precise about it at all. And it's the same thing over here. In fact, the only difference is this one is thick, this one is thin. So in terms of lasting, you probably have to give advantage to the uh, Amazon Basics. Now, if you look at the yoke, over here on the Amazon Basics, we've got one piece yoke, solid cast. Over here, we have two pieces that are held together with a little rivet. And that's not a huge deal, but I don't think that's a sign of quality either. If you look at the adjuster knob, those ears fit in there fairly well. And it's somewhat a smooth operation. It's not made out of bra brass or bronze, so that would be saving them some money. So if you were to compare that to the Bailey line, that's one area. The pin going through that the yoke pivots on, if you look down through, is pretty close to being square to that recess in there. However, if you look over on this one, I thought this one was the one that was really off. No, I must be thinking of a different one. Nothing overly impressive. It'll do its, it'll do the job, but uh, yeah, they certainly didn't spend any amount of time on any of this stuff. Now, if we look at the underside, so again, you want the blade to remain as quiet, as still as possible. Any vibration created by the blade going through the wood is going to result in a less than stellar surface. So milled surfaces, making contact with other milled surfaces is a good way to eliminate that. And if what you look here, we're talking about a, a rough cast that has been painted, so there's been no milling after the cast. And the same thing in the sole of the plane, there's no milling after the cast. So you run your hand over that and it's not very smooth. So what are the odds that this little pad and that little pad are making positive contact with this pad and this pad and this pad? Well, let's try it and see. Actually, I don't even know if that's making contest, not even getting down there to touch. So it doesn't find a natural uh, spot where it sits tight. It, so this doesn't score very high. It's, uh, it's not much. Now there's no, there's no uh, s precise adjustment at all in closing and opening and closing the throat, which would allow, which is done by moving your frog forward and back. If you'll notice on this one, they did put an adjuster on there so that when you loosen these two screws, you can turn that screw and it pull, moves the frog forward. And that's not a huge deal, but on this case, you would have to do it manually, which can be done, but nice to have a little bit of control. My, my biggest complaint here is that how much movement do we actually have where there's contact being made? So what I'm doing is I'm just putting a little bit of downward pressure and I'm just moving that forward to back, but it's, it's not a smooth operation at all. I mean, you can feel the rough cast meeting the rough, rough cast and that's, well, that's, that's pretty poor. Can it be fixed? Uh, would I do it for $27? Not in your life. So this is, this is not doing well. This is failing. Okay, we'll take the frog out of the Amazon Basics and just remind you, if you haven't seen that other video, what it looks like. So, to their credit, they've done a little bit of milling. I don't know how accurate it is, but at least, at least it's not uh, too rough cast painted surfaces sitting on next to each other. They have milled the spots on the sole of the plane and they've milled the, the corresponding three spots 
on the frog. I think we actually tried that even though they milled them. Yeah, they, it rocks. So, nice try. Neither one of these planes is getting a passing grade from me. And why do I say that? Well, if you're just getting started, you take a plane that is lousy and you don't have the uh, acquired skill yet to learn how to fix it, if somebody didn't tell you, you'd put this together and try to do it and it wouldn't work and you'd blame yourself. So I'm a proponent of buying a good tool. In fact, I've always said, buy the best you can get. You never have to replace it. But I also understand that there's those working on a budget that maybe aren't quite as serious about it that want to find something in the middle of the road. Okay, I'm going to take the lever cap and I've got one of my glass stones turned upside down so it's actually just touching on glass. I don't want to wear anything out here. What I want to do using this core stone is just determine if, if that is flat underneath. So just a little bit of downward pressure. Oh, why does that move like that so much? Oh, it slides around. Okay, so we're making contact all the way across. Even though there's some spots where it's missing, that doesn't matter. It's applying pressure, what we would call uniformly, so we don't have to worry about that. Now we'll take the chip breaker. Now, this surface has a negative angle, so when that sits on the blade, the only part that makes contact is right out here at the leading edge. And we have no idea what's been done to this because this has been a used plane. So it's kind of, unf it's kind of unfair to evaluate a used plane based on what Stanley would have produced if you're buying it new. But based on what I see, you wouldn't have expected a whole lot more. In fact, if anything, this may be better than what a new would have been. So what I'm doing is I've got the back end sitting lower than uh, the coarse stone. I've got to hold it back from the edge. If you go here, you'll end up bumping in here somewhere. So stay within about a quarter of an inch of the edge. And just light to moderate pressure. I'm going to wiggle that back and forth and see what kind of a contact we're making. So I'm touching from my left thumb to within about a quarter of an inch of the opposite side. So just a couple of seconds, I should be able to get that corrected. We want to have... Okay. We're actually making contact all the way. Got a bit of a burr on the back side, so I'll just knock that off. Now we'll work on the blade. We've done an extensive video on this, and we'll leave a link below. It's called 32 Seconds to Sharp, and it'll walk you through the entire process. So I'm just going to go through, put on a back bevel using the Charlesworth ruler trick, polish it, and then do the main bevel. Okay, so I had to create the back bevel on the 1,000, finish it on the 16,000. I had to go regrind the primary and then do a secondary on the 1,000 and a tertiary on the 16,000. So we've given this uh, the same treatment that we would on any plane. Put the chip breaker on, move that blade to within about a oh, 30 second or so of the edge. Don't normally have to take this out, but there was a lot of junk underneath it. It wasn't sliding very smoothly. We sharpened up the Amazon Basics to 16,000. Some people had commented on the video I did that I only went to 1,000. It's all right, we bumped it up, and this one is ready to go. I haven't done anything to the sole or the sides. Sole was smooth enough, there was no rust. I'll wax it just to reduce the friction. I've got the blade fully retracted. So while I'm planing, I'm going to start advancing the blade. This is a piece of black spruce, so it's a softwood. Now what I'm doing is just slowly advancing and I notice that the blade is a little bit off to one side so bring it back around. That wasn't very smooth so it went from nothing to a whole lot. Try pulling it back a little bit. I don't know if you can hear that noise, but that's essentially vibration of the blade. I'm retracting the blade each time just trying to get a little thinner shaving. 
I don't know whether the settings are gonna be fine enough to give that to me. Maybe we're off again a little bit. More wax. You really want a fine enough adjustment that you can go in there and tailor it to the job at hand. If I was working on a piece of figured hardwood, I'd want a very, very light pass. Get that blade to move over a little more. That's about as light as we're going to get it. Now, blade's nice and sharp, so it's doing a decent job on that. Now with that same setting, let's try it on something like a piece of cherry, which is going to be considerably harder. trying to determine why this is doing what it's doing. It could be that the sole is not flat, but I suspect the blade is just simply not well supported and it's, it's, fle it's flexing. It digs in, bounces out, digs in, bounces out. Not what I would consider a, a pleasant experience. I'm trying to pull that blade back a little more each time but I can't get a nice consistent feel out of it. Let's try this one. Same thing, I have the blade fully retracted. Now I'll slowly advance it. Need a little wax on this one too. Oh yeah, this is one that's got the really coarse sole. Looks like it was done with about 36 grit abrasive. You hear that ring? Yeah. All right. Let's go back to the softwood. Okay, the softwood is not nearly as challenging to the plane, that is. But you'll hear that hollow ring. Then we switch over immediately when we switch over to something tough, we have a really hard time. Same thing. So you've got a really thin blade that's poorly supported, and I believe it actually, when it engages the heavy, the thick, the harder timber, it'll flex, and in flexing, it's going to go down into the wood. And then it'll bounce back out of the wood and it's it just, that's terrible. And just for a quick comparison, let's try a, a different plane that's designed for this and see if you can't hear the difference. Pull that blade in a little more. Notice the difference in the sound and the control. Absolutely not. In fact, when we shut the camera off, that's going in the garbage. Nor would I buy that. It is not worth $27, mainly because it's not worth the aggravation. What you would have to know and the equipment that you would have to have in order to turn that into a plane that would do anything even remotely uh, good is throw it out. Do not waste your money. Maybe sitting on a mantle somewhere, but definitely not on your bench. That's my two cents. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, 
click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. Now I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools that we actually manufacture right here, as well as our workshops, both in person and online. Good luck.